Satan will use all your emotions so he can be victorious. His name is the deceiver. The pastors don't think these things are going out of their interrogation. I believe that the devil does exist. Be a disciple and make a disciple. If you don't do that by being a pastor, spectator. Confronting the Devil with the Overwhelming, Almighty, Omnipotent Power of the Lord Jesus Christ. His power is absolute. He cannot be stopped. Welcome to Confronting the Devil, Fearless Dialogue. Here's your host, Kevin Collier. Thank you for joining us. Today's guest, William Federer. But as always, we begin our program with a prayer from my wife, Kristen. God's prophet Nathan went to David after he had gone into Bathsheba. This is from Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me, we say with King David in repentance. Thank you, Kristen. What did Martin Luther say concerning world leaders? He said that the wicked rulers of this world should bow before us as children of the Most High God. Thank you, Kristen. William Federer is a nationally known speaker and best-selling author with 20 titles to his credit. He's a longtime host of the program Faith and History on the TCT Network and American Minute, which is broadcast on radio stations across the country, a valued historical resource, and a servant of God. Bill, welcome to the program. Oh, hey, Kevin. How are you? Doing fine. Where do we start here? How about the separation of church and state? Wasn't it our founding father's intent to have our country be a Christian nation? And if so, how did we arrive at today where the federal government wants to erase God? One of the things it's important to understand is the difference between federal government and state government. And so religion was under the state's jurisdiction. If you read through the state constitutions, at the time the states ratified the U.S. Constitution, nine states required you to be a Protestant Christian to hold state office. So you look at South Carolina, the 1778 Constitution, the Christian Protestant religion is hereby deemed the established religion of this state. I've actually talked to attorneys that said, well, if they wanted America to be a Christian nation, why didn't they just say so in the Constitution? I go, duh, they did their state constitutions. Did you read them? (laughs) And here's North Carolina's state constitution. It said, no person who denies the being of God or the truth of the Protestant religion shall hold any office in this state. That was in effect up until 1835 when they changed it to say, no person who denies the being of God or the truth of the Christian religion shall hold any office in this state. That was in effect up until 1868 when they said all you had to do was believe in God. Then three states at the time they ratified the U.S. Constitution were liberal, and they said all you had to do was be a Christian to hold state office. You say, that's liberal? Yeah, because by saying Christian, you could be any denomination of Protestant and even Catholic. Mm -hmm. So during colonial times, Catholics were only allowed in three colonies, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and New York, and they didn't even have full rights in those. So the country, population-wise, was 98% Protestant, around 1% Catholic, And it had only 1,500 Jews in a country of 3 million people, only seven synagogues. It was a predominantly Protestant country. And then there was an Irish potato famine in the early 1800s, and millions of Irish Catholics came across, and the Catholic percentage went from 2% to 20%. And so there was a large anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant backlash. But after that, it sort of settled down, and that's when other states changed from requiring you to be a Protestant to just being a Christian. And then there was a persecution of Jews in Bavaria. About a quarter of a million Jews came across in the early 1800s. That's when Maryland changed its state constitution from requiring you to be a Christian to hold state office to requiring you to be a Christian or, quote, if the party shall profess to be a Jew, the declaration shall be of a belief in a future state of rewards and punishments. That was 1851. And then New Hampshire required all elected officers to be Protestant up until 1877. Mm -hmm. And of course, people are saying, how could this happen with separation of church and state? Easy. Separation of church and state was to keep the federal government out of the state government government and the church's business. We have to remember, the states created the federal government. A great quote from Eisenhower. He said, we have to remind ourselves that the states created the federal government, but Frankenstein-like, the creature wants to destroy the creator. (laughs) So this federal Frankenstein is wanting to take away the rights and the powers from the very states that created it. And so we see that you cannot understand what the First Amendment meant without having a proper understanding of what was under the state's jurisdiction and what was under the federal jurisdiction. Sort of like today, some states have smoking bans and others do not. Some states allow minors to drink alcohol, others don't. Some states have gambling, others don't. Some states have prostitution, like Nevada, thank God the rest don't. 
Some states allow marijuana, other states don't. Back then, some states gave a little more religious freedom, and some states had blue laws where everything was closed on a Sunday. But it was up to the people in the states to decide. And in several of my books, I go through the progression of how it began to change. And one of the books I wrote is called Endangered Speeches, sort of a play on words, how the ACLU, IRS, and LBJ threatened free speech. It shows how the first law school was 1830. Prior to 1830, if you wanted to be a lawyer, you apprenticed with a lawyer. And when you felt like you knew enough, you sat before the bar of judges and they quizzed you. Well, 1830, you had the first law schools. And then 1859 came along Darwin's Origin of Species, which said species could evolve. Then there was a guy named Herbert Spencer that began to apply evolution to other areas of academia, eventually law. And a Harvard law professor, Christopher Columbus Langdell, decided to apply evolution to the legal theory. And he came up with case precedent theory of law. So instead of you wanting to stick with the intent of the founders, and instead of having the Constitution evolve through the amendment process, it was this idea that judges could evolve it on the court by simply changing the definition of words that are already on the law. And this influenced someone named Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. And he came up with this theory of legal realism, which cut the ties from this sacred idea that law was something that came from God and changed it to laws, just whatever the public opinion can swallow. And so now we have two kind of justices on the Supreme Court, one group that generally wants to stick with the meaning of the founders, and the other could care less. They're just pushing an agenda, and they're wanting it to evolve on the bench. Anyway, we cannot understand the intent of the founders regarding separation of church and state without realizing the difference of jurisdictions that the state governments had, and then that limited amount of jurisdiction which they gave to the federal government. Bill, what is the origin of political correctness in our country, and has it harmed the nation and our churches? Well, the idea prior to the revolution was if you wanted to rise in political office, you had to please the king. After we broke from Britain to rise in political office, instead of looking upward to being a king-appointed person, you had to look down to the people electing you. And this gave birth to people wanting to get votes, and you want to get lots of votes, and so you want to appeal to the views of the majority of the people. Religion of the different colonies was very jealously held. Virginia was an Anglican colony from 1606 to 1786. Massachusetts was a Puritan colony. Rhode Island was a Baptist colony. New York was a Dutch Reformed colony. Delaware and New Jersey were Swedish Lutheran colonies. Maryland was a Catholic colony. Pennsylvania was a Quaker colony. And Connecticut and New Hampshire were Congregationalist colonies. You get the picture. It was one denomination, basically, per colony. Their attitude was, if you don't like our denomination, fine, start your own colony. And they would chase each other out and tar and feather each other, very similar to Europe, where it was one Christian denomination per country in Europe. England was Anglican. Holland was Dutch Reformed. Northern Germany and Sweden were Lutheran. Switzerland, Calvinist. And Italy, Spain, France, Austria, Poland was Catholic. And so in these colonies, they were very jealous. And if you wanted to run for office, you wanted to be really careful not to step on any religious doctrine landmines, <laughs> because you could get people that would be very uh, much against you. And so you would say things that were appealing to the largest number of people. In other words, political rhetoric became the lowest common denominator. You would say very watered down things. But this began this idea that you want to appeal to people to get their vote. And so it was a pull on wanting to be politically correct, so to speak, where you wanted to be careful not to offend any particular voting bloc. But now it's increased to the place with the advent of media, those with a more left-leaning, gaining control of the major media markets, that they are setting the political correct tone. And if you go along with what they say, they'll praise you. And if you don't, they'll ridicule you. Saul Alinsky, in his book, Rules for Radicals, says ridicule is the most powerful weapon. Nobody wants to be made fun of. Even a kindergartner doesn't want to be made fun of for wearing the wrong color tennis shoes in school. Nobody wants to be made fun of. And then when somebody is made fun of, everybody backs away from that person. And so it's this idea that you ridicule someone and just destroy their them publicly, and then everybody backs away from them. And so now it's developed into this art of those that control the media voice decide who's going to get ridiculed and who's going to be praised. There's a large pressure for people to want to sacrifice their personally held views for the sake of fitting in. And that's actually called the uh, the spiral of silence. 
a psychological term that was studied in Germany in the 1930s with the rise of Hitler, where people held personal values, but because they didn't want to be ridiculed publicly, they would hide their personal views and then go along with public opinion, this idea of political correctness. Um, there was a study done that Chuck Colson uh, had cited where they had a wine tasting party and everybody was in on the experiment except the one couple. And so they all tasted the wines and checked whether they liked it or hated it. And this couple said, this wine was good. And this other wine tasted horrible. Well, they go around the room and the different couples are saying, well, this wine uh, tasted great, which this couple thought was horrible. And then vice versa, the sweet one they thought tasted terrible. And they go around the whole room and finally get to this couple. And they're like, um, uh, well, uh, yeah, we, we sort of agree with the other ones that, yeah, that one was... And then afterwards, it came up that it was all a, uh, a psychological setup test, and that this couple didn't want to be ridiculed, and so they they changed their public views, uh, and so this is applied uh, publicly. So if if you can set the public tone, uh, then people will, and and they, actually, it also goes back to the Greeks with their experiment of democracy and their invention of theater. Uh, since there was no king, they didn't look up to political power, they looked down to the masses. Well, what would happen is they would put on plays and get the whole city together and have comedies and tragedies. And the comedies, they would ridicule people, the tragedies they would honor and extol as noble other different people. And, um, and people would leave the theater saying, I don't want to be like that fool that was made fun of. And the other person was more noble. And so if the people are the king... Uh, which is what our system is, a republic is the people are king ruling through their representatives. If the people are king, then you want to uh, sway them. And the media and the public opinion is the way to do that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. In the current primaries leading to the nomination of party candidates for president, the Republican Party came out strong against Donald Trump, even to the point of being against the will of the party voters who clearly cast their votes for Trump, with him winning state after state after state to the nomination. There was a discussion early on about a brokered convention where the party would select the candidate. Since when, whether you like Trump or not, has a political party's wishes come before the votes and voice of we the people? Right. Well, the Constitution sets aside that electors are the ones who elect the candidate. So originally they didn't have popular elections. It was just the states having chosen electors. So every state gets, if you add up the number of congressmen and the number of senators that a state has, that is the number of electors. But the electors cannot be congressmen or senators. And so each state would come up with their own way of choosing who the electors are going to be. And over time, it came up with a series of delegates. It came up with a series of popular elections to get the votes. And then different states would tie the hands of the delegates so that they would reflect the popular vote. And other states didn't. But it was a state-by-state -state method. And you think, gee, that's pretty unorganized. Well, it is. The only alternative, though, is a direct popular election. If that would be the case, presidential campaigns would be only done in three or four cities, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, the population centers. That's sort of the way the states are today. If you go to Illinois, most of the rural people hold conservative views, but it's this huge city of Chicago and all the corrupt politics that people joke about dead people voting. That's that one city that determines the whole state. And that's basically the story of almost every state. If you would think of it, if the elector process was applied on a state level, it would be every county gets to pick a delegate, and then all those delegates get to choose who the governor's going to be. Well, in that case, there'd be a, lots more delegates from the rural areas, and you'd probably end up with a more conservative governor. But no, the states are done strictly on the population. The population centers determine. So if we did not have electors nationally, the main population centers would be the ones determining. And the candidates would only campaign in the main population centers. So the people in the rural areas wouldn't even have commercials run. They wouldn't even know that it's really going on. It is a flawed system, but it's the best that the world's seen yet. Most of the world, they still do military coups. Bill, did you ever think you would live to see the day where a socialist candidate for president, Bernie Sanders, would win approximately 20 states? Well, it is a unusual phenomenon, and it does show the lack of education that has gone on in the schools. What do I mean? One of my books that I recently wrote called The Rise of the Tyrant, I go through all of the republics and democracies 
controversies in world history, how they rose and how they fell. And so from the beginning of the invention of writing, which was around three or 4,000 BC, Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamian Valley, around three or 4,000 BC, that's the beginning of writing. You know, 4,000 BC, we're 2,080, that's 6,000 years, which in a sense is not that long. 6,000 years is only 60 people living 100 years each back to back. Everyone's met someone who's lived 100 years, maybe a grandmother. We're talking 60 grandmothers and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. And so what do these records show? Well, the records show the most common form of government is a king. Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar, Maharaja, Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, Till the Hunt. Power wants to concentrate into the hands of one person. It's this law of gravity that takes place. I think it goes back to the fall in the garden and selfishness coming into the human DNA and Cain killing Abel. You put some babies in a playpen, one of them takes the rattle from the others, put some kids on a playground, one of them is the bully hog in the ball, put some people in the woods, one of them is the Indian chief, and put them in an inner city, one of them is the gang leader. So it's sort of this Lord of the Rings, everyone wants this ring of power. And it's higher Oracle. So if you're friends with the king, you're more equal. If you're not friends with the king, you're less equal. If you're an enemy of the king, you're dead or you're a slave. It's called treason. So as the centuries go on, the kingdoms get bigger and bigger and bigger. So you have 2,000 years, 33 major Egyptian dynasties ruled by pharaohs. 5,000 years, 18 major Chinese dynasties ruled by emperors. Indian Maharaja, Sennacherib of Assyria, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, Cyrus of Persia, Alexander the Great, uh, the Roman Caesars, the Byzantine emperors, the Muslim sultans, the African chieftains, King Kamehameha in Hawaii and Montezuma in Aztec, Mexico. But ultimately, the most powerful king in world history was the King of England. He controlled 13 million square miles, a half a billion people, all of India, a quarter of the world's population right there. Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, and America. America decides we want to break away from the king, and we have no army and no navy, just a bunch of courageous people with faith. My wife and I wrote a book called Miracles in American History. It was a miracle that we broke away. And when our founders had the chance to set up a government, they wanted to run as far away from a king as possible. They took the power of a king, broke it into three branches, separated it federal to state level, tied it up with ten handcuffs we call the first ten amendments. All the Constitution is, in a sense, is a bunch of hurdles to prevent the rubber band from snapping back into the hands of a king. Unfortunately, after every crisis, there's this gradual reconcentration of power. Ultimately, you get back to one person. Anyway, the idea that the founders had was comb through history, look at alternatives. There were very few of them. Rome was a republic for 500 years until Julius Caesar found a way to make himself dictator for life. Athens had a democracy until Alexander the Great's dad conquered them. The first record that we have in history of a nation being ruled without a king was ancient Israel. Around 1400 BC, they come out of Egypt, they come into the promised land. For those first 400 years, no king. Everyone's equal before the law. And the law said there is no respect of persons in judgment. Rich or poor, everyone's the same. Male, female, made in the image of the creator. This was the beginning of the concept of equality on planet Earth, that everyone you see is equal to you. There's no royal family to butter up next to. Israel's the first nation with private land ownership, because wherever there's a king, you never really own the land. It's always conditional of you staying on the nice side of the king. You cross him, he'll take away the land and hang you. And so in Israel, the land was permanently titled to the families. If they got in a pinch and sold it every 50 years, it reverted back to the family. This prevented a dictator from gathering up the land and putting the people back into slavery. And so Israel, if you own land, you could accumulate stuff. The Bible called that being blessed. Karl Marx called it being a capitalist. You got land, you save stuff. And so they call it the promised land. Israel was the first nation with no standing army. Wherever you have a king, he has an army to enforce his will. In Israel, every man was in the militia and armed and ready at a moment's notice to defend his family and his community. Israel was the first nation without a prison system because the law said swift justice at the gate of a city and a city of refuge you could run away to, to await a trial. In Egypt, you had Joseph wasting away in prison for all those years. Israel had a bureaucracy free welfare system. So instead of Egypt selling your soul to the faith, row for a handout of grain. In Israel, when someone harvested their field, they left the gleanings for the poor people to pick through. This way, the poor were taken care of without some political leader collecting everything and giving it back out to those who could help them stay in power. So Israel was unique, and it worked as long as the priest taught the system. When the priest stopped teaching the law, it says there was all this chaos, and the people go to the Samuel the prophet. They said, we want to be like the other countries. We want a king. Samuel cries, and the Lord tells him, they did not reject you. They rejected me, but I should not reign over them. The rubber man snaps back. They get King Saul, who turns around and kills most of the priests. 
we begin to see that our founders in America attempted to do something really unique, and they combed through history, glean examples from the past, but their goal was to keep power decentralized. Unfortunately, it was great that Lincoln ended slavery, but in the process, a lot of rights went from the states to the federal government. It was great that Franklin Roosevelt got us through the Depression, but he concentrates power with his New Deal programs. And Lyndon Johnson wanted to end poverty, but he concentrates power with his Great Society welfare state. It was great that Bush didn't want to have any more terrorist attacks, but he concentrates power with the NSA and government reading your email. Now the new president, no matter what the crisis is, the answer is the same. Surrender your freedom to the government. I don't have time for a Congress. I got my pen and my phone. I'm just going to concentrate power because I want to do something good. And the problem is, no matter how good you want to do, you're fundamentally transforming our form of government from the people ruling bottom up to a dictator ruling from the top down. It's important for us to understand this history. What effect did religion have on presidents in the White House? Washington stands out to me. He was an Anglican. He was a vestryman at an Anglican church, and he didn't covet power, which to me is such a unique item. He could have been a king, but instead he gives up his power. Uh, That's a tremendous example of self-control gives orders to his troops to observe days of fasting and prayer that were declared by the Continental Congress. To the highest glory of patriot, it should be our highest glory to laud the more distinguished character of Christian. After almost every battle, he gives glory to God and thanks God and providence, which is the will of God for saving him. John Adams had a day of fasting and prayer during a threatened war with France. John Quincy Adams was a very strong Christian, and he writes about reading through the Bible every day. He writes letters to his son saying, I hear you're reading through the Bible. James Garfield was Disciples of Christ minister before he became a president. Teddy Roosevelt was Dutch Reformed. You know, William McKinley talked about Christianizing the Philippines, and there were some that were more nominal Christians, but even in that sense, it was a reflection on the country that they couldn't have become president if they had not espoused Christian values. Franklin Roosevelt giving out Gideon's New Testament and Book of Psalms to all the soldiers in World War II. He writes the foreword, as commander-in-chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces. You have Democrat President Harry S. Truman having a day of prayer nationally. Eisenhower, as president, 1954-55, had a Back to God program with the American Legion. As a former soldier, I'm delighted our veterans are sponsoring a movement to increase our awareness of God in our daily lives. Nixon had a day of prayer when Apollo 13 was up in space and was in danger of not coming back. Reagan made the National Day of Prayer an annual event, made 1983 the year of the Bible. George H.W. Bush made a year of international Bible reading. It's important to understand the role of faith. Lincoln mentioned Christianity in his inaugural address. He says, intelligence, patriotism, Christianity, and a firm reliance on this favored land are still competent to adjust in the best way our present difficulty. So it's all the past presidents, their proclamations of prayer. How important is it that we as Christians elect leaders and embrace Christian principles? Well, you have to remember, you're the king, and the politicians are your servant, Mm -hmm. and you hire and fire them. You vote them in, you vote them out. John Jay was the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. He said, the people are the sovereign of this country. Governor Morris, a signer of the Constitution, says, the people are the king. Lincoln said, the people are the rightful masters of both Congresses and courts. When you understand the people, that those in the listening audience, they are the king. The politicians are their servants. And the same way you'd hire a servant to do what you wanted in your yard, the politicians are yours, and you hire them to carry out your will. Now, it's not just a privilege. You're going to be held accountable to God for what they do, just like King David, right? He allowed somebody to do some wicked things, and he knew about it, and he let it happen. He's held accountable for it, right? Well, so in America, if you know there's wicked things going on and you're letting it happen, God will hold you accountable. Not just a privilege in America of voting. It's a very heavy responsibility. Some Americans were concerned at the time JFK was running for president because he was a Catholic. Can you address that and explain why there was a concern? He was the first Catholic president. Again, the time of the founding, 98% of the country was Protestant. And then after an 1846 Irish potato famine, uh, the Catholic percentage exploded from 2% to 20%. Even as recently as 20 years ago, the uh, Pew Religious Landscape Survey, the uh, CIA.gov website was identifying America still as 94% Christian. Now, out of that, about 54% Protestant, 25% Catholic. Now, just last year, they said America is only 70% Christian. Wow, it's gone down. But it's still a majority, but it has gone down quite a bit. And so Kennedy was the first Catholic president, and there was this concept that went all the way back to the founders, and that was that a faithful Catholic is going to do what the Pope's 
says. And so this would be a foreign leader directing our country. Kennedy came up with this new, unique way of citing the phrase separation of church and state. And he said, though I'm a Catholic, I will not let the Pope tell me how to run America because there's a separation of church and state. Now, prior to then, separation of church and state was to keep the federal government out of state business. Now it's saying that I have these personal views, but they're not going to influence my state views. From that time on, you begin to have politicians say, well, you know, I'm personally against abortion, but statewide. And it, it, it was a whole new thing. Prior to then, it's whatever you are in private, you are in public. So uh, you had W. Eric Criswell, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, gave a Sunday broadcast sermon on why Kennedy should not be president as a Catholic. Uh, does he get in trouble for it? No. Kennedy just goes down to Texas, meets with all the Baptist ministers, promises them the Pope won't tell them how to run America, and they vote for him. And so even as late as 1960s, pastors were telling their congregations who to vote for and who not to vote for. They had that freedom that went all the way back to the founding of America. It was only after that that the ACLU began to start sending these letters and threatening these pastors, and they're like, we don't understand tax law. We'll just talk less and less. Till finally, now today, pastors assume they never talked about it, where it was a very as recent as 1960 that pastors were endorsing candidates from the pulpit, and they had the freedom to. And thank you, Bill, for coming on the program. And appreciate the great work you're doing. William Federer. I've been a big fan of Mr. Federer's TV program, Faith in History, and the TCT Network for many years. You can add TCT to your Roku and watch Faith in History on demand. Also visit his homepage at AmericanMinute.com. That's AmericanMinute.com. Also, while there, check out his product menu where you'll find all of his books and DVDs. You can also subscribe to his American Minute there. Check out Bill's latest book, just released this year, Rise of the Tyrant, Volume 2 of Change to Chains, The 6,000-Year Quest for Global Power. I want to take a couple minutes here to thank our listeners and supporters. It has been amazing, very humbling, and educational for me and my wife. We can't thank you enough. Our guests have been amazing. It's been a total blessing for Kristen and I. I want to thank everyone who's already appeared on the program and thank those who are scheduled to appear on the program, including Pastor Bill Bean, a spiritual deliverance minister and exorcist, Brian Gadawa, who's been an author, screenwriter, and filmmaker for over 15 years, James Duke, he's a pastor and a filmmaker and an educator and the founder and director of Act One, Josh Peck, who is the founder and editor of The Sharpening Point, frequent guest on Skywatch TV, and also on Skywatch TV, hosts the show Into the Multiverse with his wife. Peter Slayton, who's a social media manager for the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Dr. Roger Barrier, the founder of Preach It, Teach It, who is a well-known author and sought after... who is the founder of Preach It, Teach It, and is a well-known author and sought after conference speaker... Also, L.A. Marzulli, who is an author, lecturer, and filmmaker, who is a frequent guest on many Christian television programs, and many more to come. I just want to thank everyone for their support, the people who have been on the program, the people who listen to the program, and the individuals who keep us in their prayers. We appreciate it. We do. I hope this program is a blessing to you. It's not a sensational program about the devil. It's about being warriors. And it's about overcoming fear. And it's about putting fear in its place. In the back seat. Because we are in the front seat. And our driver is Jesus Christ. We own the highway. And we know what's at the end of the road. We're victorious in Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. Now Kristen will close the program with a prayer. Beautiful Savior, King of creation, Son of God and Son of Man, Truly I love Thee. Truly I'd serve thee, light of my soul, my joy, my crown. Thank you, Kristen. Coming up on our next program, Pastor Todd Coconado, host of the radio show Hollywood Alive. Here's a preview. Many, many, many of the people that are in Hollywood have had to take vows and oaths to Satan. And I know that sounds extreme, and people think, oh, that's conspiracy, or that's not true. But I can tell you this, personally, I've witnessed it, and there are many, many other credible people that have witnessed it. And for me to deny that it's happening, I would be lying. Many people are given to that Antichrist spirit, which is on the rise in this hour as we get closer. You know, many believe, I believe, we're in the end times. Some believe we're getting there. That's Pastor Todd. Next episode, and that wraps it up for this program, I want to thank my wife, Kristen Collier, and our announcer, Steve Matheson. He kicks us off and kicks us out. Until next time, don't let fear paralyze your faith. 
And remember, we can conquer all things in the name of Christ. This has been Confronting the Devil with your host, Kevin Collier. Visit online at confrontingthedevil.blogspot.com. Thank you.